The video was prepared specifically for the AK Cashin channel. Greetings, friends. In today's video, we will continue talking about Soviet logic microchips, on the basis of which, through the efforts of industry and ordinary radio enthusiasts, hundreds of application schemes were invented. Most of these microchips were sent for recycling in attempts to obtain the coveted grams of gold. However, they can still be found and put to use. Today we will talk about not elements. For example, the LN1 microchip, and consequently, about generators made on discrete logic microchips. In the previous video, we looked at and assembled three circuits on the INE LA3 microchip, and the first was the following circuit. An LED beacon. I explained the working principle of this circuit previously. So, if you haven't seen it, be sure to watch. In this circuit, three INE elements are connected in series, and their inputs are shorted. It's not hard to guess that shorting the inputs turns the INE microchip into a not microchip. Moreover, this trick also works with the ILNE microchips marked with LE, which we will discuss some other time. So if you don't have an LN1 microchip, but you have an LA3 or LE1 microchip by simply shorting the inputs, you get a not element. Now let's talk about types of generator circuits. When it comes to logic microchips, in the vast majority of cases, it's about obtaining and further manipulating some periodic signals. The microchip is not a basic element for constructing a frequency source, however, there are several topologies of such circuits. Let's start with the classic one, which was presented in the previous video. It requires three elements, not connected, in sequence, and one additional last element, which is a buffer, so that the further part of the circuit does not affect the operation of the generator. The frequency of such a generator will be approximately equal to divided by RC. It is worth noting here that different series of microchips have different internal properties. Simply put, each microchip has boundaries for the applicability of the generator circuit. Under some parameters it will work, under others it won't. This should be taken into account. Well, adjusting the frequency requires an oscilloscope or a frequency meter, because it involves selecting the resistance and capacitance, RC circuits. For testing the functionality of such simple circuits, it's convenient to use breadboards. There is another generator topology that requires only two elements and one additional buffer. However, it should be noted that this circuit is less stable compared to the previous one. The resistor should be chosen up to 500 ohms. Overall, this circuit may require separate tuning by selecting values for proper stable operation. It is also worth noting that unlike the first circuit, the two-element circuit does not require these elements to be in the same chip to minimize the threshold variation of the inverters. The principle of generation here is also based on the charging and discharging of a capacitor, which adds inertia to the feedback. You can read more about the operation of these circuits on the Amateur Radio Electronics website. With a quartz resonator available, you can assemble a generator using the following circuit. By varying the resistance and capacitance, you can achieve precise frequency tuning. But again, you need to have a frequency meter or an oscilloscope on hand. Now let's move on to interesting circuits built on the LN1 base. As in the previous video, let's look at three useful circuits using the 155 series microchip. And the first circuit is a dual tone ringer, which my wife really liked. I was inspired by Dyakovich's ringer circuit, but I decided to modify it. The schematic consists of three generators, two of which generate sound tones, and the third switches between these tones. For this, the inputs of the sound generators are connected through diodes to the third generator. The voltages at these points are always opposite because this is a negation element. Therefore, the tone generation from one generator or the other will alternately be disrupted through the diodes. As a result, you get an interesting sound that entirely depends on the three RC circuits. I have provided the values that I ended up with. For those who decide to replicate this circuit, I recommend assembling it on a breadboard and trying different resistor and capacitor values to achieve the best sound for you. The signal amplifier is built on transistors, but if you wish, 
you can replace it with this kind of class deamplifier module, especially if, like me, you bought about 10 of them for some reason and now don't know what to do with them. The circuit can be powered by any 5 volt power source, such as a phone charger. Everything will neatly fit into a junction box. The next circuit is a running light circuit. If you look closely at the circuit, you can see three knot elements connected in series through RC chains to form a delay. The outputs of the elements are connected to buffer elements. Again, not so that the subsequent part of the circuit does not affect the operation of the generator. As a result, a logical zero will alternately appear at the outputs of elements 4, 5, and 6, causing the LEDs connected to these outputs to light up in sequence. Instead of LEDs, you can install any load by adding a power switch to the circuit. For each output of the output elements, no. The last circuit is a simple logic probe that will help you with the setup and repair of circuits on logic elements. Initially, I assembled this circuit from issue 9 of the Radio Amateur magazine from the year 2010. However, there was clearly a mistake by the author. But I liked the idea, and my version of the logic probe circuit, which already works, was created. Therefore, if possible, check the circuits before assembling. Well, since we've taken on the task of disassembling the logic circuit, I'll go ahead and assemble this device for myself, and then we'll figure out how it works. For the LEDs indicating logical 0 and 1, I used a common resistor, since they won't be lit at the same time anyway. I soldered the resistor directly to the LEDs and ran wires from them. I decided to use the casing from a gel pen as the housing. I decided to solder an additional 100F electrolytic capacitor to the microchip. Next, using the wires, we assemble everything according to the schematic. I decided to make the probe from a piece of copper wire from a grounding cable. First, I soldered a wire to it and then secured it in a housing using hot glue. Later, I sharpened the tip with a file and tinned it with solder. Let's conduct a test. I soldered alligator clips to the power wire. We connect to the power supply. We see that the LED at the end of the pen lights up. That's already good. Let's try applying power to the probe. The red LED lights up. Now for the ground. The green LED lights up. Meanwhile, the LED at the end goes out. Let's test a bit more on the microchip. In terms of ergonomics, I'm completely satisfied, but I would recommend using brighter LEDs for the ground. For the ones, the simplest 3mm LEDs I used are not readable from every position of the device. Now the device is ready, and we have confirmed that it works. Now let's figure out how. Let's imagine we applied power to a microchip that has nothing connected to it. There will be some voltage hanging on the inputs of the elements. In my case, it's about a volt. Outputs are at zero. Now let's look at the circuit. Pins two and three are connected to each other, so the logic is zero. On pin two will lead to a logical one appearing on output four, and one of the LEDs will light up. It will always be lit when power is applied, except when the probe is connected to a logical zero. In this case, there will be a logical one on output two, and a logical zero on output 4. The remaining part of the circuit works like a regular LED connected to a logical one, and a similar LED connected through negation. That is, if the probe output is not connected anywhere, one LED lights up. 
Connect it to a logical one, and two LEDs light up. Connect it to a logical zero, and the third LED lights up. For clarity, I set the indication for logical zero. Green for zero, red for one, and I place the third LED a bit to the side. This is the gadget with plus minus power attached to the circuit under test. And then just probe around with the test lead. Friends, if you liked the video, don't forget to support me with a like and comments. This helps me make new videos. All useful links are in the description. This was Andre with you. Bye.